to address plastic pollution and improve fisheries management, collectively improving seabird conservation. Most recently, the ranking member of the Natural Resources Subcommittee on Water, Wildlife, and Fisheries Subcommittee, Rep. Huffman, spoke against Republican efforts to delist the lesser prairie chicken. So without further ado, we're pleased to uh, welcome you, Representative Huffman, and uh, happy to hear more about your work. Annie, thanks for that introduction. And I am pleased to be joining all of you bird champions and advocates uh, for this event. I, I really want to begin by thanking you for uh, appreciating and celebrating the Endangered Species Act. Um, it's something that I think for a long time we probably took for granted. All Americans love wildlife and endangered species. This, this legislation has been such a success over its 50 years, but um, I think it's important to understand that the Endangered Species Act has been under direct attack in recent years in Washington. And um, it, groups like yours, advocates like you, uh, really need to, uh, I think, sound the alarm and come to the rescue if we want to hold on to this critical uh, legislation for the decades to come. So uh, I was looking at your report and you do a great job reminding people about the successes of this act. You know, the, the Republican talking point is that the Endangered Species Act was sort of a nice thing 50 years ago, but it's outlived its usefulness. It, it needs to be modernized. And when they say modernize, what they really mean is weaken, uh, because you know there's two critical um, authorities uh, under the Endangered Species Act that help it work. One of them is the listing of species, and all of these Republican proposals we've been fighting back against target listing and try to make listing harder and harder. And we've even arrived at the point in this Congress where some of my colleagues across the aisle argue that Congress should just decide listing and delisting things. And, you know, they like to vilify, vilify government bureaucrats and scientists and others as being unaccountable. They think only Republican members of Congress can be trusted to make these decisions. So, so that's why we've been fending off these wrongheaded bills to legislatively circumvent the listing process, the science-based listing process, and just let politicians delist grizzly bears and wolves and uh, the lesser prairie chicken uh, and you know sage grouse and, and everything else. So uh, that's one front that we're fighting on. But the other critical authority under the ESA that is so important to protect is critical habitat. And Republicans and the industries that they tend to represent have zeroed right in on critical habitat. Um, they really hate designation of any critical habitat and these so-called reforms that they've been pushing in this Congress uh, really are trying to dramatically weaken uh, how you designate critical habitat and what it means to actually have critical habitat. So those are really two of the most important fronts that we are fighting on. And uh, I so appreciate uh, you as allies and champions in this space. You know, birds are worth protecting. Um, some of the greatest success stories we have and the Endangered Species Act are iconic bird species like the bald eagle that have come back from uh, nearly going extinct. Uh, here in my district, we're so excited to be reintroducing the California condor in the far north uh, in the Klamath River Basin. It's a great partnership between federal, uh, state, and local uh, wildlife officials and also the Yurok tribe. And that kind of tribal co-management, I think, is one of the things that we should talk about it as we think about try to, trying to fortify the Endangered Species Act for the next 50 years. We can do a better job, I think, of uh, integrating traditional tribal knowledge, of partnering with tribes, um, and we can also try to make connections with things like, like something you mentioned, um, a fisheries bill that I've been pushing to, to uh, reauthorize the Magnuson-Stevens Act you know, for so many migratory birds and other birds, the health of forage fish uh, is critical to those bird populations. And just understanding those linkages uh, is, is super important, I think, uh, for restoring birds and protecting them and, and frankly, the entire ecosystem that we care about. So uh, I am in this for the long haul. I'm the ranking Democrat on the uh, subcommittee of water, wildlife and fisheries. Uh, I intend to stay on the Natural Resources Committee as long as I'm in Congress. It's one of my top priorities, so that will put me 
in the arena to, to work on these issues as long as I'm in Congress. And I look forward to uh, working with all of you. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, thanks so much for that. So um, you obviously touched on a couple key points. And earlier you mentioned um, some of the efforts by uh, members of Congress to decide listing status. So uh, we just wanted to know, are there any solutions you might have to protecting these species from future attempts like this? Well, defeating these statutory proposals is job number one. Uh, and the reason that's so important right now is because the, the tool of choice that uh, congressional Republicans have used is called the Congressional Review Act, which would not just uh, block the listing of a species like the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, it would actually prevent any regulatory action on that species in the future, uh, unless and until Congress revisited that issue. So it's like uh, burning the, the, the drawbridge, basically, uh, and preventing any further uh, safeguards and protections. Uh, that's why when we debated this thing, I, I basically said that the Republican plan for saving the lesser prairie chicken and other species is thoughts and prayers, because they are taking away the ability of wildlife officials to actually do anything under the Endangered Species Act if they pass these Congressional Review Act measures. Yeah. Um... So I guess along a little bit of different lines, uh, how do you see the role of funding in supporting uh, the ESA? Is there, uh, are you, would you be willing to support uh, increased funding for ESA recovery? Definitely, yeah, it's, it's a very important question. And that's probably the other thing, if, if we're talking about really modernizing the Endangered Species Act and you know, when we have our, our political stars aligned reauthorizing it, we do need to get around to that. We just don't wanna do it uh, in a fraught political climate where it will probably get weakened. Uh, but when we get to that moment, um, certainly making sure that there's more stable long-term funding for recovery, uh, that would really do a lot. And I know the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which uh, Debbie Dingell has championed, um, would help a lot in that regard. Yeah, I know also last Congress, you um, introduced the Critically Endangered Animals Conservation Act. Um, so do you have any plans for additional legislation aimed at bolstering endangered species protection? Well, the, this would uh, help support a fund, the Multinational Species Conservation Fund that the Fish and Wildlife Service uses for critically endangered animals around the world. Um, it, it is, you know, one of the few things that still has a little bit of bipartisan support, uh, in part because I think some of our Republican colleagues like to travel to exotic places and shoot big game on these uh, so-called preserves. <laughs> There's some controversy around some of that too. Uh, but we will take our bipartisan opportunities where we find them and, and I hope I can um, succeed with that legislation. Other uh, ESA uh, bolstering and protecting activities, you know, honestly in this Congress, I'm just playing a lot of defense uh, because there are so many threats to the ESA. Uh, but as we go forward, you know, that, that Magnuson reauthorization, uh, we call it the Sustaining American Fisheries for the Future Act, will be really important for seabirds and migratory birds. Uh, and there are other things that, that we're going to be working on. Uh, you know, one of our keystone species that nearly went extinct uh, is the, the sea otter. And we are doing something really exciting in my district. We're talking about reintroducing the sea otter in the north coast of California. And when I talk about it as a keystone species, there actually is some connection to birds and those who love birds, because when these keystone species are returned to the environment, uh, the entire ecosystem, uh, in this case, for California, the, the kelp forests and all of the species that benefit from the kelp forests and the birds that benefit from having that healthy array of species uh, will all do better if we can get those sea otters back on the North Coast. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so being mindful of time, I'll ask one more question here. Um, but is that I know you mentioned there's a lot of defense that you have to play this Congress, but are there any plans maybe next Congress or hopes of um, modernizing the ESA? 
Yeah, it's just, of course, we need to reauthorize the ESA. It's been hanging out there without reauthorization for many years. Uh, but we've, we've just got to be very careful about how and when we do that. Uh, because, as I mentioned, our Republican friends say modernizing. What they really mean is weakening and gutting. Uh, and so with a Republican majority in the House, this is like the worst possible time to open the door to modernizing or reauthorizing the ESA. I would want to see um, a, a really reliable political uh, lineup in the House and Senate and the White House before I would want to open up uh, the ESA. But we will, I'm sure, in the years ahead, have an opportunity to do that. And we should all be ready to jump in and do it right when that time comes. The two things that I mentioned that we should include in a reauthorized ESA, I believe, would be stronger tribal partnerships and integration of ancestral tribal knowledge, uh, co-management opportunities, uh, but then also funding for recovery. If we can do those two things, I think the ESA would uh, would benefit from it. And um, we should be careful about uh, anything else that is masquerading as ESA modernization or reform in the meantime. Yes, definitely. And thank you so much for being here today and talking about the ESA. And we look forward to supporting your efforts, maybe not this Congress, but in the next Congress and certainly defending some of the um, things coming down the pipe. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. All right, so now we will turn to Steve Holmer, uh, Vice President of Policy for both the American Bird Conservancy and the American Bird Conservancy Action Fund. Steve has over 25 years of experience working to conserve endangered wildlife. In the context of endangered species, Steve has specialist knowledge on the conservation of the endangered northern spotted owl and marbled merlet. Today, Steve will explain how the Endangered Species Act has prevented bird extinctions and fostered successful recovery efforts while also highlighting some of the several challenges that uh, are currently being faced. So Steve, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks very much, Annie. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share our report celebrating 50 years of the Endangered Species Act. And um, we really appreciate your uh, participation today. And um, we're interested in trying to, to start bolstering and building more support for the Endangered Species Act. And just to um, offer a little quick word about the American Bird Conservancy Action Fund. Um, American Bird Conservancy created the Action Fund as a way of trying to build more political support for bird conservation. And this means building bipartisan support in Congress. And so a lot of what we're dedicated to are events like this where lawmakers are able to share their, their views and their interest in advancing bird conservation. And it's also about delivering thank yous. Um, you know, constituent thank you letters are very valuable in terms of motivating lawmakers to, to make this a priority issue and to take action. And, um, some of these issues are contentious, and so they're going to be hearing from all sides, so it's very important um, that they hear from us. And when we look at the Endangered Species Act, it, it truly is a, an amazing success story, um, particularly for birds. A, a number of birds, the California condor and the whooping crane, were at very low numbers um, and have now been brought back. They're still endangered, but um, you know, the fact that they're in existence is, is a testament to uh, the importance of listing species. Um, same with the, the, the bald eagle population in the lower 48 states. It was largely eliminated. And if not for the, the banning of DDT and then the protections provided by the ESA, um, we would not be seeing the remarkable recovery that's now underway um, for, the, uh, for the bald eagle. And when we look at how the Endangered Species Act works, you know, listing is critical, but also the designation of critical habitat, which protects the um, essential habitat that the species need for all parts of their life cycle. And it's, it's a combination of, of these protections, um, the, the preventing of take, but also protection of habitat that is, is what we have seen to be the recipe um, for recovery. And for birds, we have quite a few examples of success where we've managed to bring back um, and actually delist a good number of species. Uh, the bald eagle and the peregrine falcon um, are, are great examples. Um, more recently, we saw the recovery of the black cap vireo. 
And this was um, uh, delisted in 2018, and it was through a combination of habitat um, restoration and conservation, as well as control of the brown cowbird. And now um, that population is actually um, coming back at, at a nice clip. Um, the Kirtland's warbler is um, another species that was recently delisted, and, and this really was the result of decades of work um, to provide for the habitat needs for the species. It, it inhabits a, a fire-adapted pine system um, up in Michigan and Wisconsin and Ontario, and it takes some active management work to provide the conditions that it needs for, for its breeding success. Um, but we've been providing those conditions, and uh, the, the bird is breeding successfully and coming back at a decent clip. Um, and so we were able to, to see it delisted a few years ago. Uh, another great example is uh, the interior least tern. Um, this is actually a shorebird that lives inland along um, rivers and lakes. And it was actually river management that was causing um, the species to decline, where the sandbars that it breeds on in the rivers uh, were being inundated due to water management um, being conducted by the Fish and Wildlife Service and Army Corps of Engineers. And these agencies then worked together and the Army Corps changed um, how they were doing the water flows on the rivers to you know, provide for shipping, but now they're also providing the sandbars needed by the interior lease turn and they're coming back at a rapid clip. And so this is a, another example um, of how a, you know, a relatively um, uh, benign solution was available that is now actually you know, bringing the species back at, at a good clip. It's not all, unfortunately, success out there. Um, we still need the Endangered Species Act because there are still species that have been in decline and need its protection. Um, and in just the last couple of years, uh, we saw the listing um, of the lesser prairie chicken, uh, the elfin woods warbler, uh, band rump storm petrel, um, and the black rail. And a number of other species are, are sort of in the pipeline. Um, American Bird Conservancy petitioned for the listing of the Oregon Vesper Sparrow. And uh, there's also the, the Black Cat Petrel and the California Spotted Owl listing processes are, are also currently underway. And, uh, and we support these listing decisions. We feel like um, you know, the, the best pathway to recovery is to see a listing. This then makes the recovery process and funding available um, and also provides the necessary protections and backstop to make sure that, that um, there aren't further losses. So, uh, so we're seeing this process play itself out and work very effectively, and we feel like we need to, to continue building on those successes. Um, there are a couple of, um, you know, I'd say groups of species that are uh, not doing as well, and, and these are some of the wide-ranging species that inhabit public lands. Um, the, the sage grouse, the Gunnison and greater sage grouse are examples. Uh, we also have the California and Northern Spotted Owl um, and the Marbled Merlet. And, um, and all of these are species that need added work, um, additional protections for their critical habitats. Um, the Gunnison sage grouse, which lives in Colorado, is, is currently in a fairly significant decline. And it's, it's a very low numbers. There's only about 3,000 um, of these birds. Um, inhabiting uh, habitat mostly in Colorado. And it's unfortunately on a, on a bad trend line. And, um, and so there are efforts underway to recover this species, um, but it's an indication where, you know, due to political machinations, um, protection was delayed. And then it's been a struggle to get adequate um, on the ground conservation happening. Um, I feel like these things are happening now. And, and all we can say for the Gunnison is that it's hopefully that we, we started in time. Um, for the greater sage grouse, there's a, a different problem. Um, since 2014, it has been um, prohibited from being protected by the Endangered Species Act as a result of a, a congressional rider. Uh, and this um, legislative rider has remained in, in place every year since 2014. And, and unfortunately, I think has, has started to cause some significant setbacks um, for the grouse. Um, based on a, a set of uh, management plans, the grouse was determined to be not warranted um, for listing in 2015. Um, but since then, we've pretty much just seen reversal after reversal, where many of the, uh, the promises made to conserve grouse habitat have been rescinded by the states, um, rescinded by the agencies during the last administration. 
And so it's, it's, it's a, you know, a species that, that is in, in pretty serious trouble that um, we're going to need to see more action on. There are new management plans being put forward by the, the Bureau of Land Management, as well as some other um, side policies of, of, of importance to, to mitigate impacts. So we really appreciate the administration and the Bureau stepping up. And, and really, in a sense, what they have to do is come up with a management scheme that's commensurate with the Endangered Species Act, because this is a species in decline that, that is in dire need of this protection at this point. Um, Chris Farmer will be talking in a minute about um, Hawaiian birds. And then I just wanted to mention a couple more things. One is about pesticides. Um, for a long time, the Endangered Species Act uh, was not being applied to pesticide decisions. This was something that the Environmental Protect Protection Agency should have been doing, um, but that, that work was just simply not happening. As a result of some litigation, um, this is now uh, taking place. We have already learned from a number of initial reviews that quite a few endangered birds could, could in fact be at risk from some of the pesticides that have been approved. Um, and so through this process, we're hoping that EPA will put restrictions or, or ban pesticides that prove to be too dangerous. Um, this is a very important process. Um, again, they weren't doing this work for decades, and so it's, it's now going to take decades to catch up. And so um, to help that effort along, we are trying to boost the funding for the Environmental Protection Agency's Pesticide Office so that they can do these species reviews as well as to increase funding for the Fish and Wildlife Service so that they can do the necessary um, consultation work. And then the last thing I just point out is that we have been closely tracking the um, recovery of listed bird species. We did a, a report in 2006 and then again in, in 2016 and, uh, and now we've been working on updating it uh, for the 50th anniversary. And this is part of an ongoing process that looks at the status of all of the, the bird populations. And overall, we can report that the Endangered Species Act is in fact working, that uh, the, the majority, about 70% of the, the birds um, are stable or increasing or have already been delisted. And, uh, and, and we really can't say that there's been any extinctions of birds that, that, that you know, we definitely should have been able to save. So, um, so for birds, the act has, has been a phenomenal success. Um, and through our analysis of the, the species in decline, it's able to help us target our efforts. And that, that's one of the reasons why Hawaii is such a, a front burner um, area for our engagement. There's as many as a dozen species that are at risk. And through a remarkable um, series of conservation efforts, it's our hope to, to bring um, some of those species back, and if not all, all 12 of them. And now I'll turn it over to Chris Farmer to talk about the, uh, the work in Hawaii. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, let me get my screen set up here. Okay, so everyone should be seeing the start of my talk. Um, the Endangered Species Act has been critical in saving Hawaiian birds. Um, as Steve hinted at, though, there are still some challenges remaining. So I want to give a little bit of a perspective about how the Endangered Species Act is uh, applied here in Hawaii and how it is helping to save birds and how the, the policy and advocacy that Steve and Representative Huffman are working on at the Hill are having real practical applications out here in Hawaii. So hopefully some of you have been out here, but if you really look at it on a globe, Hawaii is one of the most remote, isolated archipelagos in the world. And this has a lot of consequences, some of which we'll talk about later in the political sphere. But as far as biologically goes, is there was a lot of open niches, a lot of open habitat, because it's a volcanic uh, created set of islands. So whenever animals arrived here, there was a lot of room for them to expand into. If you look at it another way, a lot of times people don't realize how big the Hawaiian Islands are as far as the spatial extent. If you look down at the bottom, let me see if I can get my laser pointer. So hopefully if people can see down here at the map inset is when you look from the big island of Hawaii out to Curie Atoll, it goes from almost Washington State to North Carolina. And think about the amount of habitat that is on the continent. That's an incredible diversity of habitat. And there's also a diversity of elevation. The Hawaiian Islands go from sea level up to about 14,000 feet. So there was an incredible 
opportunity for animals that arrive here. And the birds are some of the first to arrive. And so there was an incredible explosion of them filling all the different types. Um, there's no reptiles, there's no land mammals. And so the birds filled in all these different niches. And here's one set of those birds, the Hawaiian honey creepers, which are just renowned for their level of diversity, is they have things like down here, a parrot, the kiwi kiwi, a parrot bill. We have up here, uh, the Akipoalao, the uh, woodpecker. We have a bird here, the palila, that eats an incredibly toxic seed that uh, will kill other birds. And so there was an explosion of diversity that caused Hawaii to be renowned for uh, the number of birds, but also uh, lobiliads, the type of plant, uh, the picture wing fly. So in a lot of different groups, they were able to just uh, really fill up the habitat. Unfortunately, there was a lot of loss as well is about two thirds of all the birds have been lost. And if you look at, let me clear this off. If you look at the ones that are surviving, which is what the bar chart on the right is over here, is most of those are listed under the Endangered Species Act in some way, shape or form. So there are ones that are possibly extinct, ones that are currently endangered and ones that are threatened. And so the green bar is the forest birds, the passerines, the small songbirds that you see up in the forest. The kind of pale blue bar are the water birds. These are things like the nene or the Hawaiian coot, things that are found in the freshwater. The yellow are the seabirds, so things like the wa'u, the Hawaiian petrel. And then over here in pink, we have the raptors, the Hawaiian short-eared short owl, the quail, or the Hawaiian hawk, the eo. And so first we'll talk about these extinct birds. These are 11 species that have not been seen in decades. The last one was seen in 2004, the Pouli. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service officially still classifies those under the ESA as endangered, but unfortunately, those of us who work in Hawaii are thinking that those are unfortunately extinct. So this talk is going to focus on these two columns, the endangered and threatened. And if you look, you can see the majority of our birds fall under protection of the Endangered Species Act. And the endangered species in Hawaii are at a much more dramatic, drastic, severe level. And we'll get to that in a moment. I do wanna talk about some of the successes first. If Steve hinted that, that in his uh, overview and the Nene or Hawaiian goose up here on the top went from being endangered and got downlisted to threatened because it had done so well due to the protections of the Endangered Species Act. The Hawaiian hawk, the one down on the bottom left, was actually moved from endangered all the way to unlisted. It had had protection that had recovered enough so that the populations were doing good. And so thanks to the ESA, it was able to be moved off the list completely. Unfortunately, it's not all in the positive direction. One of the most iconic birds, the EEV, the scarlet hunting creeper seen on the left there, went from unlisted to threatened. This is a bird that used to be found statewide on almost every island. Um, but now is unfortunately only found on some of the higher islands like Hawaii, Maui, and Kauai. And the reason why there are so many endangered species is many fold, is there's a lot of habitat destruction, making uh, subdivisions and freeways, but also with cattle grazing, introduced sheep and pigs, introduced rats and cats. But one of the biggest is mosquitoes, and that's something that affects the Hawaiian honey creepers particularly. And so these are 12 species that are at risk of extinction due to mosquitoes and avian disease. These are 12 that Steve briefly mentioned. And as I said, the Hawaiian honey creepers, um, the levels of the population, the population levels here are so small that it, we're at high risk of losing these birds. So the ones on the left in the purple are only found on Kauai. In the middle and the kind of the more magenta are on Maui and then red is Hawaii Island and EEV there at the bottom right is statewide. And so when you look at the numbers of individuals, something like the Akikiki has 40 to 50 and actually probably less. It's been a really rough field season out there and has a hard time finding nests. On Maui, the Koei Koei and Kiwi Kiu are also both at risk of extinction as they have very low numbers. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of different factors, but the primary one is mosquitoes and avian malaria. Is the honey creepers arrived six -ish million years ago. Mosquitoes arrived in 1826 and malaria arrived in early 20th century. And so the birds by that time had lost any resistance to malaria and they suffer incredible mortality. One bite of infected mosquitoes enough to kill most of these birds. Uh, EED particularly is this 
uh, are particularly sensitive to it. But also some of the others like KiwiQ, the one on the bottom left, suffer and rapidly will die when they're bitten. And so if you think about those population numbers, is if you have 130 odd KiwiQ, the Maui parrot bill, is if you get a large outbreak of mosquitoes, that's 135 mosquito bites are enough to cause a species to go extinct. One of the things that we've been really fortunate about is that the mosquitoes and malaria parasite are cold intolerant. <clears throat> what this means is they've been mostly confined to the lowlands, is if you think about Hawaii, most people come and they visit our beautiful beaches and lovely tourist uh, combinations, but those are mostly converted. Those are not native forests. And so the mosquitoes and malaria were doing well on there, but there's no native birds there. The native birds were confined to the upper elevations because of this cold intolerance. As we've heard by now is climate change is causing the world to warm up. And in Hawaii, we're seeing a lot of those effects in a lot of different ways, but particularly with the Hawaiian honey creepers. So this is what it looked like in the beginning is you have the mosquitoes there at the bottom right who are just down to lowlands. As the climate has warmed up, they've moved up the mountain and are causing the birds to vanish. And we're seeing this on Kauai, we're seeing this on Maui, and we're starting to see this on the island of Hawaii, is Kauai, where is a lower island, the mosquitoes are now breeding at the highest parts of that mountain, I'm sorry, the highest parts of that island year round. And this is a complicated slide, and so don't worry too much about the, the details. The points are, in this upper left panel, all four of those birds I talked about earlier are all rapidly declining. In 2021, a group of the scientists who are most experienced with these birds and most out in the field with them tried to estimate what the rate or what the uh, date of extinction would be. And that is incredibly difficult um, because there's so many unknowns there. And best we come up with these big broad bars. The take home from the slide are these highlighted numbers over there is the time to extinction in the field was 2023 for Kikiki, 2027 for KiwiQ. And so the timeline for these birds is incredibly soon and trying to save them has taken an effort from all sorts of the conservation organizations in here. These are all endangered species. And so the funding for this has primarily been driven by that uh, legal status. And so this seems incredibly overwhelming. It can be uh, tough for some of the people on the continent when they're first exposed to this. But the one thing I want you to take home from this is that there's hope, is that for decades, we didn't have anything to do. But after uh, advancements in human health and uh, human disease protection, is we are standing on the shoulders of millions of dollars of uh, research and lots of practical applications in how to solve human transmitted diseases by mosquitoes. And so what you see on the right there is a cell of an insect and these blue things are Wolbachia bacteria. And so Wolbachia is a bacteria that serves as a form of, in effect, mosquito birth control. And it's found in about 50 to 6% of the insects worldwide. It's common in the Hawaiian insects. It's already present in our mosquitoes in Hawaii. And it has an incredibly cool property, is that when you have mosquitoes with different strains, that's what this graphic on the right is trying to show. Is this one up here has blue Wolbachia, this one has red Wolbachia. And it's not the color goes just for the purpose of the graphic. But whenever those different strains mate in the wild, the eggs don't hatch. So by releasing the males with a different strain, they find the females in the field, which we can't do very well. They mate with them, the eggs don't hatch, the mosquito population crashes, and so they are unable to transmit avian malaria. So by releasing these males out into the field, we were able to establish a barrier protection and save the birds. I said, this is something that's been done for human health, and we are just using it for a conservation purpose. And so a group of the conservation organizations got together and formed the Birds Not Mosquitoes Partnership. And it has nearly every conservation group, including the Department of Health, who's interested in it for human health purposes, uh, working in Hawaii. I particularly want to call out the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service as two of our big federal partners who, due to the ESA connection, have been able to drive incredible amounts of funding and really help this project to occur. Um, and so they've been working at getting the funds, but American Bird Conservancy and the Nature Conservancy have also been working uh, on the Hill to support them. As you know, Rep Huffman just mentioned, is it takes both sides of that coin to make things happen. So it's really been a collaborative partnership to get the funding and resources necessary to implement this. And unfortunately, I don't have time to get too much into it, but this is an incredibly complicated project working from uh, Hawaii Island across to Kauai with 100 plus people and 15 odd organizations 
working on the mosquitoes and Wolbachia part, working on producing the mosquitoes we need to release them to the lab, uh, release them to the field, uh, deploying them out into the air where the uh, mosquitoes are found in the fields of Maui and Kauai, and working at reaching out to the community and explaining what it is we're doing, talking with people about the birds. Is unfortunately most people in Hawaii have never seen a native Hawaiian honey creeper. Is the birds are confined to these upper elevations, and it's hard for people to see them. So going out to these communities and talking about how important and how critical it is is that that connection has been lost. And originally, the Hawaiian birds were a touchstone for the Hawaiian culture. And so talking about that as well. And then the regulatory approval is there have been numerous permits and environmental assessments that we have complied with and worked through that process. So after a long process, we're at the point where we can start to save these birds. And so these are the 12 species that are at risk of extinction. But with this technique, we believe that we can save all of them and help them to start to recover. And so the generation that we are in now, the, the field, uh, sorry, the field biologists working today are the ones that will be able to save them. And it's a tremendous opportunity and it's tremendously exciting. Um, but we're also the, the people who have the last chance to save them. We've lost so many birds that it's a real tragedy. But because we have the tools and techniques and we have the resources through the ESA, we are hopeful that we will be able to save all these birds so that future generations can experience them as well. And so that was a really brief overview, but that's what uh, the ESA has allowed to happen in Hawaii to help protect birds from going extinct. And there have been a ton of people, I said, it's a huge project across the island with a lot of different supports. So I want to thank all of these people as well. And then I'll hand it back to Annie for any questions from the, the audience. Thanks so much, Chris. That was a great overview. Um, I definitely found it super informative. Um, so yeah, we have received some questions. Some of these might apply to Hawaiian birds. Some of them might be more general and then feel free to jump in, Chris, with a Hawaii perspective. But um, the first thing I, uh, the first question I have is why is federal funding important to endangered species work? So uh, maybe Steve, you can start off and then Chris, maybe you can add a little bit to that. Sure. Well, um, you know, the, the funding for recovery is how we get huge projects like this, this Hawaii mosquito project done um, and, you know, similar efforts for all the other listed species. So, so for Hawaii, um, one of the outcomes of the 2009 State of the Birds report is that there was a state of the birds activities line item put into the interior appropriations bill and this helps fund um, ESA recovery efforts in Hawaii and so ever since then we've been you know trying to boost the appropriation for that program I believe it started at 2.5 million a year and uh, has now been bumped up to, to 4.5 million a year um, and so we really appreciate the leadership of the Hawaii delegation and uh, through this, you know, annual appropriation, we're basically starting to see more and more work get done each year. And now it's culminated in uh, combined with some money from the, uh, the infrastructure bill um, supported this, this huge Hawaii project. Chris, do you have more on that? Yeah, that was a really good overview, Steve, is Hawaii, as I mentioned, is incredibly isolated. So a lot of the ways that species get saved is, you know, collaborations between states, or especially with migratory birds that are moving around, why we're isolated. So it's really only our state. And we're a small state, as we have a small congressional delegation, we have small resources compared to some of the larger states on the continent. And so the federal funds are really the only way that we can save the, these species at the scale we need to. And so without the federal funds that Steve detailed, we'd be unable to implement this. And, um, but thanks to the ESA, State of the Birds, and our federal partners, is we are gearing up, we're hiring the deployment teams on Maui and Kauai, and are excited to start putting this into practice in the fall. Yeah, so sticking with you for a second, Chris, um, someone asked, you know, what are the priority islands for the Mosquito Project right now? And I think you just answered that, but um, is there anywhere else or just those two? Sure, is we have a grand vision across the state is, you know, my own personal hope is to get these birds uh, recovered and get them onto some of the lower islands so that people who don't experience them can have an EEV in their backyard. But at the more immediate scale is Kauai. The Kikiki and the KKA are at risk of extinction. So trying to get the mosquitoes deployed there is one of the highest priorities. Maui also has a very narrow band of habitat that is suitable. So trying to get them applied, deployed there. And so we are moving forward on both those fronts simultaneously. 
is the other islands are a little less uh, critical. Hawaii Island has higher forests, so it's less at risk of extinction. And the other islands, unfortunately, are low and have already lost their birds. So we are going to work on the regulatory approach for those birds, in, I'm sorry, for those islands in 2024 and start to roll things out then. Thanks for sharing that extra context. Um, that was super helpful. Um, so I'm going to shift over to Steve now. Um, someone asked, are there any Republican members of Congress we can work with to defend and move the ESA forward? Well, I, I would say we need to try to work with all the uh, Republican members of Congress. Um, you know, I think part of the problem that we're having right now is that this has unfortunately become a, a, a very partisan issue where, you know, most of the people in Congress supporting the Endangered Species Act are, are the Democrats and, and many Republicans are, are not as supportive or actually supporting rollbacks. I think that the way that changes is that more Republican lawmakers need to hear from their constituents that people really care about species protection. I, I think it's been kind of a, a, a myth been, you know, promoted that development and endangered species protection are not compatible. In fact, we've seen time and again that they really are. So I think that, that some of the perhaps the fears that lawmakers are responding to um, really can be worked through and, and be addressed. And so, um, so I, I think that part of this begins with constituents. If people write letters to their lawmakers and thank them when they do positive things, um, we can start, you know, hopefully turning around uh, what, what has been a bad trend line, <laughs> and, and that is that we do need to have bipartisan support to, to maintain the endangered species and to get adequate funding. Yes, um, definitely send those thank you uh, letters to your Congress members, and the Action Fund has some easy forms, so I'll just plug that now. You can go to our website and send those very easily, um, but Another question for you, Steve, is why is it so difficult to protect birds on public lands and specifically in the context of critical habitat? Why is it so difficult to sometimes protect that critical habitat? Sure. Well, you know, I think that it's important to remember that, that birds are excellent indicators of the overall environment. And the fact that some of the wide ranging species that inhabit public lands are in decline is an indication that, that the public land habitats, in, in fact, are, are in decline or not available for those species. And, and you know, I'd, I'd actually have to say that the, the political back and forth that we've been seeing in recent years has really been, been hurtful, both to the public lands and, and those species, um, where we see one administration advance some conservation efforts, the next administration comes in and reverses them. And it then takes time to, to you know, basically get back to where we were before. And so, so I'd actually have to say this political back and forth has been really harmful to species and to public lands. And again, that's why it's so critically important we build, you know, broader bipartisan support um, and get both parties behind endangered species protection. Because I think that, you know, because birds are such a good indicator of, of overall health, if we can bring the birds back, it's going to benefit all of us. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, someone can else. Add, oh, yeah, go ahead. Can I add just something that to help put that into context is you see perfectly correct, but also that the degradation and damage has occurred over decades in most cases is that, you know, depends on which situation you're talking about, but in Hawaii, it's decades. And so expecting to have a recovery in one or two years is unrealistic. But I've had that conversation sometimes like it is two years and they want to know why is the bird not recovered? Well, there was a hundred years of habitat destruction. And so you just need to have a equal commitment of resources to the recovery. Yeah, you know, that, that's an excellent point. So some of the public lands recovery efforts do are, are talking about, you know, literally decades in order to, to bring back the habitat conditions at, at, a, at a wide enough scale um, to provide um, for the viability of the species. Yeah, so I guess um, another question we have is, how would you go about strengthening the ESA? Like what 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 mechanisms can make um, the law stronger? Well, I think that right now that the, the thing that we need most is to get politics out of the process. Um, you know, I think where we've seen, you know, really the biggest problems and mistakes have been where, the, you know, the science-based listing process was not allowed to proceed where species that should be listed were not. Um, so I think that just, you know, getting politics out of that is, is really step one. And then step two is to continue to increase funding for recovery. Um, we're seeing success. 
Um, if we continue down that path, we're going to see more and more species um, ultimately be delisted because of recovery. And, and that's, that's the goal, so that, that, that we will be securing these species and um, have put in place the habitat conditions that will allow them to continue to flourish. And I think that we'll see that there's numerous side benefits. Um, for example, protecting the spotted owl forest is a huge win for the global climate by storing carbon, a huge win by providing clean drinking water for communities. And so we'll see that there, you know, through these efforts that there are in fact that, you know, some, some very important side benefits that we all um, will, will appreciate. Yeah, I guess um, uh, kind of not as much on the positive side, but what about um, kind of there, there, there was a recent uh, narrowing of wetlands protection. How can things like this impact the Endangered Species Act and um, what can be done to respond to that? Sure. Well, um, you know, management of, of key habitats, that, that is one of the things the State of the Birds report showed is that, you know, certain um, suites of birds tied to habitats are doing better than others. One of the few success stories has been wetland birds, and, and, and they're, um, they've come back in, in tremendous numbers, so it would be a, a huge, um, you know, setback to see the loss of wetland protection. Um, this is something that is going to be, you know, in Congress and in the, in the courts for a, a while to come. I just read today that the Biden administration is going to do a new wetland rule that I, I'm hoping will, um, you know, address some of the legal concerns that, that the most recent court decision caused. So, so this, there is kind of a, a, an ongoing back and forth. And I think that the way we get the best outcome of this is by being politically active, by letting our lawmakers know that this is an, an issue of importance to us and that we would like to see them support a strong Endangered Species Act and, and other policies like wetland conservation, um, like the mitigation of impacts when we do decide to do development. There, there are there are smart ways to do things and, and there's ways where we kind of put the blinders on. And I think that, you know, getting back to the point about politics, I think that, that in too many cases, we've put the blinders on and waited too long to work on species conservation. And so by being honest with ourselves, looking at the facts and following the science is really our, our best path forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I have one more question and this one is for Chris. Uh, given the rapid pace at which natural selection can occur, especially for insects, are there any concerns about how long the mosquito control program can remain effective? If I understand the question, is there is a lot of questions about how effective it will be at the scale we're talking about. But as far as the natural selection in the mosquitoes, is the uh, incompatible mosquitoes don't reproduce at all whenever they mate is 99% something that the eggs don't hatch. And even the ones that do hatch, are unable to then breed. And so there's not the chance for natural selection to work on that. Um, one of the things I didn't have time to get into is though that it's going to require continual releases to establish that barrier of protection. And so that we, it is reversible if there's some question or problem that if we stop the releases that it will slowly go back towards the natural state as mosquitoes from the lowlands invade up into the mountains. And so uh, we are going to be carefully monitoring things and looking for any indications that it's not working the way we expect it to. But for that particular uh, rate of natural selection with the insects, it doesn't seem to be a concern uh, in other studies that have done something similar. Thanks for providing that extra um, information. And thank you both, uh, Chris and Steve, for talking today. Um, I think we're at about time, so we'll wrap it up here. Um, also, I want to extend a thank you to Representative Huffman, who provided um, some really good context and information. So for more information about the Action Fund, please do visit our website, www.abcbirdsactionfund.org, um, or you can also uh, like us on Facebook. Uh, we are American Bird Conservancy Action Fund on there. So I will let everyone go. Have a wonderful day, and thank you for tuning in. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.